So we will begin with prayer. Today we have, we're going to present to you our refugee resettlement program. This is Refugee Week. We are talking about uh, the social principle of solidarity and the corporal works of mercy and caring for the stranger. So we'll begin in prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, when you multiplied the loaves and fishes, you provided more than food for the body. You offered us the gift of yourself, the gift which satisfies every hunger and quenches every thirst. Your disciples were filled with fear and doubt, but you poured out your love and compassion on the migrant crowd, welcoming them as brothers and sisters. Lord Jesus, today you call us to welcome the members of God's family who come to our land to escape oppression, poverty, persecution, violence, and war. Like your disciples, we too are filled with fear and doubt and even suspicion. We build barriers in our hearts and in our minds. Lord Jesus, help us by your grace to banish fear from our hearts that we may embrace each of your children as our own brother, brother and sister, to welcome migrants and refugees with joy and generosity while responding to their many needs, to realize that you call all people to your holy mountain, to learn the ways of peace and justice, to share of our abundance as you spread a banquet before us, to give witness to your love for all people as we celebrate the many gifts they bring. We praise you and give you thanks for the family you have called together from so many people. We see in this human family a reflection of the divine unity of the one most holy trinity in whom we make our prayer, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us today. Bring you um, our colleagues, our people who are in the vineyard working with refugees and even from a parish perspective. So we're absolutely excited about this. I bring to you uh, Margaret Ayat, Huda. Please help me pronounce your last name, Huda. Alhamdani. <laughs> Alhamdani and Penny de Groot, who is at St. Lawrence. In, um, and so I don't have their bios up. So if Margaret, you can tell us a little bit about what you do with Catholic Charities, how long you've been with us and, um, and about some of the work that you're doing. This time Huda, if you'll do the same and then Penny, if you can share with us what you're doing at St. Laurent. So I am Margaret Tayot, and I've been with Catholic Charities now 15 years. I uh, work with the refugee resettlement. I uh, assist with the resettlement of new arrival refugees and the border crossers, walk-in clients uh, for the first six uh, months of their period here before they uh, continue to Huda <laughs> for the rest for another five years. So I do the initial resettling and then Huda takes over. Uh, and she does some of the initial resettlement for the walk-ins too. And she's gonna tell you about that as well. And most of my explanation is on my slides. <laughs> All right, perfect. Huda? You uh, muted are you Huda? To Huda, are you Huda? Are you my internet is it's showing uh, it's unstable. Okay. I see that it, it kind of froze there a little bit, but we could see you now. Okay, um, if, if it happens again, let me know so I can connect sure. from my phone because okay. it keeps coming in. Okay. Okay, so my name is uh, Hudad Hamdani, um, uh, originally from Iraq, came to the United States 10 years ago through the Catholic Charities, uh, worked as a volunteer with the Catholic Charities, and then I couldn't leave <laughs> because of the amazing work they, they do, and we do actually here. Um, I, work, I started as uh, a case manager, and now I'm a, a program supervisor. Uh, so my background is IT, <laughs> that's my uh, the degree that I got, but I changed my career completely with 
Like, I just love helping people. And I, did you I went say that, did you say IT? Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. How long were you in that industry before you came to Catholic Charities or to the United States? Uh, so in the beginning, I was uh, like doing uh, connecting cables and, uh, but I worked for like uh, two years. And before that, I used to give uh, trainings and like different type of, you know, uh, software. Uh, okay. And I used to work as a, a teacher in the university, like a, a substitute teacher. Okay. Um, yeah. That's interesting. But it, it was That's all in, in Iraq when I came here. So I left Iraq and I went to Egypt uh -huh. after the war. And I stayed in Egypt for five years. Um, in Egypt, I used to work as a teacher, uh, like a, a school teacher. Okay. And well, that's honestly, interesting before that you coming to the United States, uh, yeah. I went to church and I prayed that I would get a job. You froze again. <laughs> Buddha. Buddha. Uh -huh. Okay, we'll come yeah. back to her, but she she just basically you know said that she changed industries and that's a lot of truth for a lot of the refugees who have high very high degrees in their countries of origin and then when they come to the united states then they change careers many times um but anyhow so penny if you'll introduce yourself well hi everybody i'm penny DeGroat, and i'm the director of the social concerns ministry at saint lawrence um i've been a member here since 1999 and a big volunteer. Um, but then about 10 years ago, I came on as the um, outreach coordinator for three years, four years. And so I've been the director for six years and we have so many ministries and programs. And so I just oversee all of those and I absolutely love helping people. Thank you. And that's kind of like the way some of our other parasocial ministers are. They're over many ministries and at each parish, it's different, but you have an interesting perspective on the relationship that you have, that your parish has with our refugee resettlement department. So we look forward to hearing some more about that. So let's go ahead and start our presentation. And I see that Ascension has joined us and she's with Ascension Amado. She is a parasocial minister at, um, St. Ignatius of Loyola in Spring, which is right down the street from, uh, not too far from Christ the Good Shepherd. Yeah. <laughs> so they do a lot of work. The neighbor, you. yeah. Yes. Thank That's you. Right. <laughs> All right, Margaret, take it away. Okay, so um, as you all know, refugees come from all over, and uh, sometimes the media does not really give us a good picture of how the refugees are. So some come from very, very, very poor neighborhood and uh, share a bed or don't sleep on the floor, have no food, live in a tent. But we have some who are educated like Huda. They lived in a very good place. They had very good life. Uh, they migrated out and had to start all over again. So when they come to us, we do not assume. We just treat them as all as one as the Lord wants us to. We do not discriminate. We give them everything equal. And that's why I'm starting with my slide. If we can go next. So again, who is a refugee? A refugee, uh, the slide's gonna talk about who is a refugee and uh, how do refugees get to Houston and how does Catholic Charities assist the refugees? Next. So basically, uh, the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 428 established the High Commission of, of Office of Refugee, which is UNHCR, in December 1950. Next slide, please. So the purpose of UNHCR is to offer advice to governments on determining refugee status as part of the mandate to promote refugee rights and protection. So UNHCR encourages governments to adopt rapid, flexible, and uh, liberal admissions to process, recognizing how difficult it is to often 
uh, is to document a refugee claim of persecution. What do they mean is, so you find a refugee can, has to have left their home country, gone to another country to determine that they're refugees. They cannot be a refugee in their own country. So they have to have left their country, gone to another country and gone to seek help with NHCR, register with the NHCR to be determined a refugee. So sometimes it takes 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. We have had clients here who've been in a refugee camp for 30 years waiting, waiting to be determined that they're refugees, uh, uh, to be sent to another country or to be sent back home. So usually what UNHCR tries to do is to see whether the country where they came from is gonna be stabilized for them to be able to be returned, repatriation and start a new life with a new government. So if that doesn't happen and that country continues fighting and has no peace, that's when a refugee can be given a second country to go to. Which countries take a lot of refugees? Australia and the United States. Europe mainly do not take a lot of refugees. Uh, fr uh, fr uh, uh, places like Norway, Sweden might take some refugees. England does not take refugees at, at all. Next one. So in 1951, the UNHCR convention relating to the status of refugee is the key legal document in defining who is a refugee, their rights, their legal obligation of, this, of the states. Next. So again, in that article, oh, uh, they, uh, they uh, agreed that uh, owing to a well found a, a refugee is because of owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, political opinion, um, uh, outside of their own national uh, country, and is unable to or is unable to go back or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country. So they have to be really, really afraid to go back to their country to be a refugee. Go ahead. The United States is part of the 1951 UNHCR convention and has its own refugee status, determination and procedures. So once a refugee is determined is coming to the United States, has to go through a lot of baiting. baiting. That's why it takes a lot of times and has to be interviewed by a lot of people. And the last people to interview them again is a group from the United States. So the federal government sends people from Washington to go to those camps and do their own investigation and background checks so that they can come here. So they make sure that the refugee has no other serious uh, uh, criminals before they can come back. The Department of Homeland Security determines a person's refugee status in accordance with the domestic legal system. So they are the ones who go and investigate that. Next. Uh, overseas, the UNHCR, uh, refugees are referred by UNHCR to representatives of the US refugee program. The US Department of State sets up uh, eligibility interviews with the refugees. The US Department of Homeland Security is brought by the State Department to interview refugees to determine if their claim or persecution is credible. Uh, if Homeland Security approves a refugee's claim, he, she is admitted to the US as a refugee. And the airline ticket is bought by an organization called IOM, Organize, uh, International Organization Migration, which they have to pay back. Next. So Catholic Charities has a cooperative agreement with the US Department of State through our affiliation with the USCCB through USCCB MRS to provide core services to refugees. So what happens once the client has been determined is coming, they have been through the medical checkup, they have their tickets ready, then the USCCB is informed by the Department of State, then USCCB contacts any of the Catholic Charity refugee resettlements in, in Houston, if it's Houston or Louisiana, whatever it is that the client had already been assigned to, then we have two weeks to prepare for that refugee to arrive. So the core services, we start planning the core services, we start assigning a caseworker for that person, we start finding an apartment for that person, we start arranging for donation, we start arranging for food uh, before the client arrives. Before client arrives, the apartment has to be ready, food has to be in the refrigerator, and somebody with an interpreter has to be ready to go pick them up at the airport. And all of the refugee resettlement agencies in the US provide all design 
to lead refugees to self-sufficiency within six months of arrival of the, in the US. Next. So the Department of State prepares uh, approved refugee case for the America through the pre-departure orientation, ESL classes and health screening. Next, I should have moved that slide up. Refugees are authorized to work from the moment they arrive in the American soil. They are eligible for the green card after one year and they are eligible for citizenship after five years. So when they arrive, we apply for them a social security card their employment authorization arrives within three to four, three to four weeks. So we start find we give them orientation from the moment they arrive, prepare them for jobs, and start searching jobs for them. Next, uh, as I said earlier, they pay back the airline ticket. So if it's a family of six, they already owe the government almost seven thousand dollars. If it's a family of nine, they already owe the government nine thousand dollars before they even arrive in the United States. So they all before they arrive. And then as soon as they get a job six months right after that, they have to pay back like $45 a month or $50 a month until they pay it all. If they don't, it goes back to their credit. It's a, it, it affects their credit. Next. So how do refugees get determined to come to the US? The president, the presidential determination determines admission ceilings. Every president determines on September how many refugees can arrive in the US. So in um, usually it used to be about 50,000 to 60,000 a year. Uh, in 2015, 2016, US admitted 70,000 refugees. September 30th, before President Obama left, he determined 110,000. But when uh, President Trump came, he reduced it down. Uh, and then it was about 45 that arrived in 2018, 2019, about 30,000 was admitted, was uh, approved to be admitted, but only 15,000 arrived. 2019, 2020, 18,000. Uh, and then 2020, 21, it was reduced again to about 15,000. But President Biden, when he came, he decided it's gonna be up to 60,000. So we don't know yet. Uh, especially for us in here in Catholic Charity, we've only received about 100 since September, uh, since October. So we, we are waiting to see. We've had that July going on, it's going to pick up. We're going to be very busy. So we are waiting to see what's going to happen. Uh, move on. So again, I uh, should have moved that slide. <laughs> the Department of State allocates refugees to National Network of Nonprofit Volunteer Refugees which is us, Catholic Charities, and other agencies. We have other agencies in Houston. We have five of them. And they each have their own volags, their own headquarters in Washington that determine how many clients they can receive. So in Houston, we have five agencies and we work very well together. That's Alliance, Interfaith Ministry, YMCA, uh, Refugee Services of Texas, and Catholic Charities. We have a quarterly meeting every three months. We discuss issues affecting refugees. We discuss how we can help refugees. We discuss about job issues. We discuss about the funding. In fact, most of the budget we have, we apply together because we believe uh, we cannot only help refugees as a one group, but as a whole group together, united. Next. So the groups that we received in 2019, 2020 mainly were uh, refugees and asylees and uh, Cuban border crossers. So we had a few Iraqis who are, uh, asi are uh, uh, SIV, that's a special immigrants. Afghans are also SIV, special immigrants. These are people who have fought alongside American uh, army in their countries. So they are, uh, they are under fear of being killed by their fellow countrymen because they are seen as, as, as traitors fighting alongside Americans. So they get special immigrants, they have a green card when they arrive and they are very educated, they speak English and so they can easily get into good jobs in the US. Uh, one slide back. <laughs> as for Cubans, we have a lot of Cuban border crossers who come in as paroles. Very few of them are asylees. I, uh, I should have added their Venezuelans. We had a lot of Venezuelans who are asylees as well. And uh, Iran, Iran, most of them are Christians who are persecuted, who have been uh, practicing their religion underground. And so as soon as they realize that they're going to be caught, they run out of their country, they go to Turkey and apply as asylum. 
Uh, we have a lot of Africans from Congo, and most of them are not Congolese. They are from Rwanda, Burundi, due, due to the genocide in Rwanda and Burundi. They lived in Congo for many years. We also have Congolese. Uh, we have Somalians. Very few Somalians are coming now, but at that time there were. We have a few Sudanese. In fact, last this week we received a Sudan, Sudanese young gentleman. We still receive Burmese, but most of the Burmese we're receiving now are either Rohingyas, as you know, the war in Burma and the issues that affected Rohingyas. Uh, some of them are coming also from Malaysia, so we still receive them. Bhutanese, we have a very few Bhutanese now, but that time we had a lot of Bhutanese coming. Next. So the programs we give them, the core services we give them is cash assistance. One person gets about $1,000. Out of the $1,000, we have to get housing for them. We have to buy uh, furniture for them and food. So that 1,000 is not enough for one person. So usually we reach out to churches for donations, St. Lawrence uh, for furniture and stuff to help supplement that $1,000. Uh, we provide the airport pickup. Uh, if you ever want to go to the airport with us, let us know. We'll go together, pick up the refugee, welcome them to the United States. We provide orientation so they can know American culture, American rules, otherwise they can get into trouble especially domestic violence, to beating children. These are some things that they are used to do in their country. So it's good to correct them before they get into trouble with CPS. Education system for the children, for themselves. They cannot pass citizenship unless they learn English class. Uh, in, this program, in that program too, we do look for volunteers to teach the ESL as well. Case management, this is the program HUDA supervises. So after six months down here with me, six to eight, we send them upstairs with case management that help them up to about five years. Employment services is also down here, but it can continue up to five years again. Employment is the key. We have to have them hired within three to six months to be self-sufficient. Next. Um, most of these programs, we still have them and some we don't. The reception and placement, like I said, for new refugees, March grant program in the March grant, any donation you provide any money given to these refugees, the government matches it, and then we can be able to help the new other clients who are arriving in the next year. So March Grant is really, really very important. And we really appreciate Sylvia Morales here. She collects a lot of donations for us from well, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, from Walmart, and we supplement that to our clients as well. The Cuban Haitian program, as I said, we don't have Haitians anymore, but we have Cubans still coming. We settled last year about a thousand. And I think we are, we are now up to 600 right now, since October to now. And the number is increasing with the Cuban border crosses. We provide them refugee cash assistance, employment, and uh, case management. Older refugees, we help with also, uh, Catholic Charity has an older refugee department. So we also uh, work with them as well. Uh, strengthening refugee uh, marriage, we work with uh, orientation for that. We have vocational training program that um, uh, vocational training program that, that uh, helps with, hello? We have vocational training program that helps the refugees who want certification programs. Literacy and trauma, as you know, all our clients have come through some trauma program issues. So we do provide that as well with mental health. And Hudak will talk more about that. She, she, she works a lot with that. After school program, we just started recently. It's not funded by the government. It's funded by foundation. And our our pro, our department upstairs, development department helps us a lot in finding funds for that program. Next. So Catholic Charities follows the Department of State's definition of refugee self-sufficiency. Healthy adult refugees must be employed and not accessing public cash assistance exceed, uh, except for food stamps no later than 180 days. So we, they have to be self-sufficient quickly. Next. Okay, refugees are eligible for cash assistance program, cash and rental for very short time in the US only. They are eligible for other support services such as employment, case management, vocational training, literacy cases for five years from the arrival services and end at five years be, uh, because refugees are eligible for citizenship at that point and, be, and accept mainstream services as any other uh, citizen. Next. 
All programs are free to refugees. Programs are funded by the Department of State's Health and Human Services, Office of Refugee Resettlement, Homeland Security, Texas Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs. Our after school program is the only service funded by private funders, like, like I stated. I think that's a, next. I think that's the only one. Yep, yeah, that's it. So, who that goes next? If you have questions, you can ask later. <laughs> So I'm using my phone right now because I lost the connection on my computer. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, as Margaret mentioned, uh, after <laughs> after the so the refugee I, because I went through the whole process that Margaret talked about, and it's it's a really lengthy process, and I was one of the lucky people because uh, I was able to be processed with a couple of years, but some refugees, they stay there for God knows how long. And some people, they, they get married in the camps and so their children will be born in the camps. Now, when they arrive here, it's, it's a shock because as I mentioned, I went through this and I'm, I have bachelor's degree and I spoke English so can you imagine people who do not speak English, they live in camps, it, it's, it's literally a shock. And the, the, they are giving only six months to stand up on their feet, which is kind of a miracle. If it's a, a single or a couple, it's easy, but when they have kids, it's really a struggle. That's when the case management, which the program that I work with, steps in after they finish the six months from being in the RMP program. We continue to help them, but unfortunately our program doesn't have a financial assistance, like from the government. We don't have money that can help like the RMP program where the rent is kind of paid. Uh, and you know, the problem is like the, the amount that the, the government assigns for each person has been the same for several years, it did not increase. So, but the rent has been increasing and the expenses have been increasing. That's why we always uh, get our support from the churches, yeah. the parishes, the, um, the donors, the general generous donors who really stand with us uh, to help our refugees uh, accomplish, you know, and like do so many accomplishments and, and get their life together. Uh, in our program, we continue to help them, like to show them how to navigate different systems here, like the school system, the health system. Uh, if someone gets in trouble due to maybe, you know, speeding, um, if there is uh, someone gets sick and they are unable to continue with looking for a job, that would be our, our main thing that we provide. And if we can support them with rental assistance, also again, it's from donations mainly. The program that I got obsessed with is the PC program. Uh, the, it's the preferred communities program. And it's mainly for, for clients who have health issues. And uh, we're gonna give some examples so we serve the same population uh, through SAS, which is the case management program. Uh, so we serve everyone who exits the RMP program. We continue with them, give them the support, help them to apply for the green card, make sure that they are still working. If they lose their job, we connect them with employment to get them a new job. Um, if they get sick and they need help with the doctor, then we, we can enroll them in those programs. And sometimes we even get the referrals from the day that they arrive because of the severity of the case. Next. So uh, as I mentioned, the, the program that I'm gonna talk about now is the preferred community because I'm gonna give you some examples of the services that we provide to our clients. It's a program uh, also with, uh, within uh, the Department of the Refugee Resettlement and its government uh, funded program. 
The goal of the program is to assess clients to become self-sufficient uh, and able to navigate the health system on their own within maybe a year or two. Next. So we serve the same population, refugees, asylees, Cubans, uh, American, uh, special SIV, special immigration visa, and victims of trafficking. Next. So uh, the services that uh, we provide is just what I mentioned. Uh, and usually we enroll the client for uh, one year, uh, hoping that they will reach self-sufficiency within this year. If, if they cannot, we extend it for only one more year. So a total of two years. Next. Uh, I'm gonna give some examples and uh, one of the examples is like a refugee from Sudan. He was referred to us because um, he had burned, uh, like he was affected by an explosion. So he has burns all over his body and uh, under, so he was telling us that, and also he lost his vision, like both of his eyes. Um, so he was always in a, like in pain, always in pain, like, unbearable pain. He was uh, admitted to the hospital several times and then they give him painkillers and he gets discharged. Then he was referred to our program. So the, the services that we provided, I'm gonna talk about right now. Next. Okay, so the, the first thing we did for that client because he was crying, literally crying from pain. So we had to take him to the emergency, but uh, it's a different type of emergency because uh, for the, the type of insurance that uh, refugees get does not cover cosmetics. And unfortunately, the burns, even though it, it was hurting him and it, it had so many pus underneath the kilos that he had, like the, that were all over his chest, arms and neck, um, it will still be considered as cosmetic. So they were just giving him painkillers because Medicaid does not cover. So we, here comes the, the role of our generous, you know, donors, the doctors who would, you know, donate their time and expertise to help our clients and like help them to know like what programs they can apply for uh, through which you know, type of insurance they can come and get those type of services. And a lot of, uh, we have several uh, doctors who are willing to do all those services for free if they have their own practice. So for this specific client, we had to connect him with a, a doctor in Galveston because that was uh, the, the person who agreed to help him. And he advised us to rush him to the emergency in Galveston. So we took him to Galveston he was admitted and the doctor noticed that his he had really high fever and it was all because of the infection that he has under his chest. So they, they took him right away to, the, uh, to do a surgery and they removed all those pus, uh, you know, that was causing the infection. And they started um, doing uh, a skin craft. So they, because he was unable to move his neck he couldn't move his neck because it was all one piece. Um, so they they removed everything. And they did skin graft. So he, now he is able to move his head. Um, they took all the keloids that were on his chest, and it looks much better. It does not accumulate any more, you know, infections. It's not causing him. That's one thing. After we finish this, he he he's here by himself. Um, so we had to apply for SSI because he's unable to work. Um, and SSI is supplemental security income uh, for people who are unable to work, which our refugee qualify for. Uh, we connected him with a nursing home because of the severity of, you know, uh, it, it was very intense. Uh, the, the skin craft, it needed specific attention. So he had to be in a nursing home. Nobody else would be able to take care of him. We connect him with nursing home, skilled nurse. We involve the adult protective service. Um, we had uh, 
uh, home health provider for him, approved. Uh, we put him in a group home until he and connected him with community. Eventually through the community, he was able to find a roommate and he moved to be in his own apartment. Uh, we continued, so we helped him also to get his green card and uh, we are working on a family unification uh, to bring his family from Sudan. Next. Uh, so that's an example of someone who arrived through the program through the Catholic Charities. However, we still see people who just come knock our doors. So one of our, our clients in the PC program, um, she just came to the Catholic Charities because um, she was homeless and people told her, go to the Catholic Charities, you'll free, you, someone will help you there. So she came and, and she had a big scar on her head because, and it still has the stitches because she was praying uh, uh, in a church and she fainted. When they took her to the emergency, they found that she had a, a, a tumor and they had to remove it. So after she was discharged, she had no place to go because she lost her job. And that's why she came to us. And uh, Margaret helped us to find uh, a volunteer who agreed to take her to, to her house. Um, and she took care of her uh, while we were, we were working uh, on getting her, you know, uh, connected with, with the doctors, working on her SSI. Um, um, she, because of like, because of also lack of knowledge, she did not know that she's applied, like she was getting some loans from not credited places. So she had a huge debt and we were helping her to, you know, eliminate those debts and, and work on, on paying those debts off. Uh, with her SSI, we connected her with a group home uh, who took care of her for a long time until she was able to get a job finally uh, after her situation got stabilized. Next. Um, so actually, I already mentioned the things that we helped her with. So we helped her with the citizenship application. We helped her to follow up with the doctor to remove the stitches in the beginning, and then you know continue to follow up. We connected her with because she had some the tumor affected her mental uh, status, and uh, she had to be connected to the mental health facility, and. Um, they helped her to you know, stabilize through a program that they have, it's called the ACT, where they go do home visits and make sure that the, the patient is taking their medication properly. Uh, they do counseling. It's a very good and intense program through the MHMRA. Um, um, and she's working on her citizenship actually now because she's unable to uh, apply for citizenship unless she pays her debt off. So she's, she's working paying her debt, and then she will apply for the citizenship. So that's uh, uh, mainly what we work, uh, like some examples of the things that we do. This is like, <laughs> we have so many stories <laughs> that we can share uh, for our clients, for, for people who are in, in PC, the preferred community, and for people who are in case management, uh, who are, working really hard, you know, to start a new life. And actually, we are all here, we believe in a second chance. So everyone deserves a second chance. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Huda. Thank you, Margaret, for those great presentations. Does anybody have any questions, comments? None? Okay. Now we're going to go to the parish perspective and uh, the activity there. So thank you. And this is Penny DeGroot. Well, hi, everybody. And I just want to say thank you, Rhonda, for inviting me to share uh, the programs we have here at St. Lawrence that help our parishioners to answer our baptismal call to welcome the stranger among us. So the Social Concerns Ministry has partnered with 
Catholic Charities Refugee Resettlement for 20 years now. And um, I'm so thankful that I've been able to work with Margaret for 10 of those years. We have a lot of fun. We, we really have a good time on our project. So first, one of the most important ways I think we support refugee resettlement is um, through our monetary donations towards rent. These funds help ensure that the refugee families facing eviction can stay in their homes and continue to work on becoming self-sufficient. Um, one of the ways your parish could do this is to um, maybe have a special collection once a year, maybe in June, because it's uh, National Refugee Week. So um, we, bi we build this into our budget because we've been doing it for so long. So um, next slide. Okay, so we have uh, four annual drives per year. Um, these drives benefit hundreds of families throughout our, our community and refugee resettlement is included in each and every one of these drives. So in the spring during Lent, we have the Giving Tree Drive and um, with the donations we receive from this drive, we can adopt four to six families providing the essentials most needed for their new homes, such as housewares, linens, cleaning supplies, toiletries, everything uh, that they need. So when a parishioner takes one, or in some cases, many of these tags, they are helping to take care of the family's basic needs. Um, and in addition, we partner with the St. Lawrence Catholic School fourth graders who feed the spirit of the children of these adopted families, but more on that later. Um, another thing the Giving Tree provides is diapers and wipes for the spring refugee baby shower. Um, in the summer, we have our shoe drive and we provide back to school shoes for, ref for 50 uh, children um, so that ca they can return to school in the fall with dignity, better prepared to learn and play. Um, I remember one time Margaret bought a family and um, this sweet little girl had worn off the very back of her flip-flops. And um, so, so we love uh, giving them new pairs of shoes and Margaret says they're so excited when they receive them. Um, then we have our two holiday drives. Um, our Share God's Bounty Thanksgiving drive provides at least 50 complete Thanksgiving meals, including a frozen turkey. And um, the caseworkers are so great. They come to St. Lawrence and they pick up the meals and deliver them to all of the families. And um, <laughs> one time a family called Margaret and they had put the frozen turkey in the oven and said, this, this chicken's not cooking. And uh, <laughs> so, so Margaret had to set them straight on, on how to cook a turkey. Um, and lots of times at the end of um, the day, there's extra meals and we share them with even more refugee families, but we start with at least 50. And finally, our Wish Upon a Star Drive is our Christmas drive and we provide Christmas presents to um, about 75 uh, children. So if maybe if you already have a giving tree or Christmas, tr Christmas gift program, you can um, connect with Margaret and maybe add a few refugee families to your, um, to your gifts. So um, if you wanna, the thing about these drives is if you wanna hold one of these drives at your parish, it doesn't really cost much. Um, next slide. So here's what the tag looks like. Um, of course, the cost is printing the tag and you'll need uh, volunteers to coordinate the tagline and organize the gifts. Um, and so you can see on the tag um, that, it, that it supports the refugee resettlement program. We always include our Catholic social teaching that states why we're doing it. And then you can see at the bottom, um, that's where the different tags go. And so, you know, there may be a tag that says a, a you know, a um, set of pots and pans, but then there's also tags that ask for a bottle of Windex. And the great thing is that so you're giving everybody an opportunity and a bottle of Windex might cost $2 and pots and pans $100. So that option um, is great. And the reason these drives are so successful is that one, 
they're very well advertised in the bulletin um, through all of our parish communications. And two, because many parishioners, um, they really want to do something, but they just don't have the time to volunteer. Um, but these drives give them a great opportunity to give back if they don't have time. This is a great way. Next slide. So over the years, our Loving Creations Ministry has created many beautiful baby gifts to bless the expectant mothers at the Refugee Resettlement Baby Shower. Here is a picture of the handmade baby sets they made just a couple months ago. Um, so if you have any sewing or crafting ministries, they might like to do something like this too. Um, next slide. Here's a picture of donations from our Vacation Bible School students. So the curriculum they use always lends itself so well to helping others in our community. And if you look to the left, you can see uh, this year, um, this particular year, um, one of the grade levels collected socks and underwear for the ref, which is much needed by the refugee families. And so, um, and we have a very large vacation Bible school, usually about 200 kids. So we're able to help so many in our community, community through um, that program. And then um, from time to time, Margaret reaches out to me. There might be a family that needs a wheelchair, a walker, um, car seats. Over the years, we've given several car seats. So what I do in that case is I have a weekly newsletter and First thing I do is give the parishioners the opportunity to give the wheelchair, the walker, the car seat, and it makes them feel so good to do that. So if you have a weekly communication or monthly communication or a page in the bulletin, this is a good place that you can ask for um, things like that. Um, next slide. Okay, so I just want to mention um, none of what we do in social concerns would be possible without the support of our pastor. Um, a pastor support provides from the top down the funding, scheduling, and promotion that is so essential for the success of any parish program. So in addition to the timing and practical details, be sure your pastor understands the benefits and impact on his parish. That way you'll have the most influential voice in your parish promoting your message. Um, and finally, I want to share with you our, our absolute favorite service project with um, the St. Lawrence uh, Catholic School fourth graders, which I mentioned just a little while ago. I'm going to share a very abbreviated version of the presentation that we give to the students. Um, next slide. So very much like Margaret's, I think we took this from Margaret um, <laughs> and we use it. Uh, we introduce the program to the kids and we give them basic facts about refugees. Next slide. And then we include pictures to really help them understand and give them a visual image of what it means to pack up everything you have, in this case, loaded on a bicycle and leave the home that you sometimes they just love their home. They don't want to leave, but they but they have to. Next. And this picture is uh, quite striking as it illustrates um, that these families really put their lives at risk for a chance at a better life. And next. Um, then we continue. It's kind of like Margaret's presentation. We want the kids to think to know the facts, you know, why do you think it's important that the refugees um, are authorized to work when they get here? Um, what does it mean to be self-sufficient? Next. And here um, we give them some more facts. We make sure they know which corporal worker mercy we're working on. Um, we let them know that social concerns adopts two families. Next. And then this is um, our presentation from 2019. So here, you know, we were letting them know that the, you know, the president determines the number and that it's that President Trump, you know, lowered it. Next. Okay, and just some more facts that we give them next. And where do the refugees live? 
Next. <clears throat> then we introduce the families and the students learn about some of the struggles of the family struggles. We, depending on the case, we can't tell them everything, but we let them know, okay, in a week, you're gonna meet your families. And this is a little bit about them. Next, we show them a map of where their family is from and show them how many miles away they came which they love all this. This is social studies. They, they love all these facts. Next. All right. And then we show them a picture of their family. Next. Okay. So about a week later, Margaret and her staff bring the families to meet the students. Um, here, here's where we give them their responsibility. So we tell them we're going to bring the family and this is their responsibility to find out all these things about the family. Next. So here they are sitting in the cafeteria. This is half of the kids and the other half of the kids are on the other side of the cafeterias and the, the families are sitting up front facing the students. Um, they all have their little notes and they like, you know, they every single one raises their hand and they eagerly um, want to ask the refugee children questions to get to know them better and to find out their dreams and hopes for the future. So based on the family's answers, um, the volunteer moms put together a shopping list. Next. Then we give them their responsibilities. So they've got to do chores to earn money to buy the gifts to feed the spirit of these children. We ask them to pray for the family members as they work and of course to turn in the money that they earn doing their chores. Next. So all the monies come in and, and the moms go shopping. And about two weeks later, Margaret comes back with the families. Um, first they come to our office and we present them with their basic needs. So everything from pots and pans, dishes, silverware, towels, um, a laptop computers um, and um, we usually have a nice pizza lunch together and we get to know the family a little bit more. Um, then we head down to the school and you can see this is um, these are the gifts that the that the um, children receive based on their hopes and dreams for the future. So if someone says they want to be an artist, they get, you know, coloring books and and crayons and drawing things. And if they want to play guitar, they'll get a guitar. And we, they even ask the moms, they want the moms to get something special also. Um, so next, here's another picture of, we love this family. They had eight children. And so uh, this little guy on the left, he was a handful. No, well, they were all handfuls. <laughs> They were a beautiful, beautiful family, and that's the that's the biggest family uh, we've ever helped. It was it's just such a blessing to meet all them. Um, so the parents usually you could see a guitar here in the foreground, but um, the parents uh, just tear up. They can't believe something like this is just not just doesn't happen in their country, and they are just so overwhelmed with the kindness and the gifts, but more overwhelmed with the kindness that the fourth graders show their children. Um, so then we, they, we get ice cream and the kids go play on the playground for about 30 minutes. And again, the, the St. Lawrence kids just love on these kids and they give them hugs and like that 30 minutes goes by so fast they don't want to say goodbye. Um, so um anyway that's that's it it's um was there was there one more slide i don't think so oh yes okay playground fun i have to show the playground fun here they are with their ice cream and there's one more next and then we always take a big group picture um for the bulletin uh, because we really want to promote this is what we're you know, this is what we do for refugee families. And um, this um, project has also been featured in the Texas Catholic Herald two different times. And um, in the hopes of getting other schools to take on a project like this. So if anyone 
ever, I mean, Margaret and me, we need to make a video of how to do this because it's, it's, it's a really a great, great project and the kids never forget. They never forget their fourth grade um, service project. So if anyone has any questions or wants to see a longer version, you know, the regular version of what we uh, show the kids or have any questions about any of our programs, just let me know, contact me. I'd be so happy to help you. And thanks again for inviting me. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Rhonda, Rhonda, yes. St. Ignatius. St. Ignatius also offers Thanksgiving and they bus the, the families. Yeah. And they've also paid for bus for our summer after school program. So that's great. Uh, oh. Anne recently called and they they they, they want to do what St. Lawrence is doing with the fourth graders. So their fourth graders started small by just getting donations and putting them in shoe boxes. So we went to pick it up two weeks ago before the schools were closed. So maybe later on they'll reach out to, to Penny and find out more. So that was yeah. great. That's wonderful. I see that Ascension is on and she's at St. Ignatius. Uh, Ascension, do you want to chime in? Yeah, there she is. Hi, yes. Hi. Hi, Margaret. Yes, we have a lot of fun. It's uh, Thanksgiving um, day. We try to give them the idea and, and, and uh, uh, just involvement with our traditions with with uh, uh, holidays and we have a lot of fun they come uh, we have about 120 uh, people so that makes about 60 or so families and they come on the bus we have um, a meal for them as traditional as possible um, and they get to um, eat with us. We have parishioners also from Christ the Good Shepherd and we sit at tables with them. Um, I know we many times we can't communicate but that doesn't matter. We have Google Translate. We have um, also the staff, Margaret's staff that can help with translating and we have built some wonderful relationships family to family that way. And the children get to play, we do activities um, and we give them then their goodie bag with also some um, household items and things that they can come uh, bring home with them. And uh, it's a wonderful experience. And I do wanna thank you guys for allowing us to do that. Thank you. I think that now that the, uh, this administration will be increasing those numbers, um, the more parishes that have this information, we will be, we'll need to reach out to you in hopes that you're able, your parish community will be interested in supporting programs such as this or any of the other programs that you've heard of through this period. How do y'all like doing these parish connects like this? Zoom. I, I have really enjoyed sharing the information about some of mm -hmm. our our services this way because you don't have to go anywhere. Y'all are so busy. I know that like Penny and Chris and uh, Ascension and Olga, I have constant communication with y'all and Stephanie at, at St. Francis of Assisi. I talk to y'all the most of those who are on here and I know how busy y'all are and I know how hard it is for you to get up from your office space to travel to another area. But Hopefully at some point we can have a retreat so that we can uh, come together in solidarity and in person and uh, celebrate the gift of parasocial ministry. I see a couple of other people, Thomas Smithson. And uh, what parish are you at, Thomas? You're muted. In the conference. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry, I bought. Hi. No, it went mute again. And then St. Jude. Who was on here from St. Jude? Mm. Okay, that one's muted also. Okay, well, hopefully we'll be able to. Yes, Chris. I have two quick questions. Okay. One, I was just interested in knowing are there refugees that have been relocated and settled in this? I'm from Friendswood, south of Houston. Are there refugees in 
where are the refugees located? That's my bottom question. <laughs> so we basically mainly resettle them in the Southwest area, which is uh, Hillcroft, Chimney Rock, um, Derry Ashford, West Timer area, mainly because of the Metro bus. The federal government requires that we resettle them in a walking distance to the Metro bus, walking distance to the grocery store, uh, and easy access to the hospitals and clinics and uh, schools as well. But uh, in some occasions, we do have some clients that have been resettled in Clear Lake area. Mm -hmm. I think we've had about three or four resettled in Pearland area, which is closer to Friendswood. Okay. So once in a while, we do have family members who are reuniting with their family members and have to leave where their family members are. Got so it. if you have somebody in your Friendswood area, we'll reach out to you. <laughs> okay, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, yes, Olga. Well, sorry, I have a question about uh, Venezuelan um, refugee application. What is the average? It is, and the process is still for a long time. I'm sorry, because we have a lot of Venezuelan families come to our parish and they ask uh, for asylum or they are not refugees or they consider refugees. Um, this is a question for Margaret. So for Venezuelans last year was a record because they were being given asylum within a week to three months. It was very quick. Okay. And, and then all of a sudden they, it's changed now. They're getting TPS. For some reason, they are getting TPS, and if they get TPS, we cannot serve them in the refugee program. Okay, uh, they have to have mm -hmm. asylum for us to serve them. Um, uh, our immigration department can assist them with that. We have a, we have. I can, I can have a Rhonda send you their phone number. They need to make an appointment, and in that program, they have Chala where they can get any any immigration lawyer who comes to the Chala and can take their case. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also have YMCA that works with us, that is also having lawyers that can help them. Okay. okay. But as soon as, tell them as soon as they get the asylum, call us. They can get assistance with rent and uh, cash assistance. Okay. And another question, I would like to have information about the four graders program from St. Lawrence, um, adopting families. I would love it to have how we can start this program in our school here in St. Martha. Penny? So. Okay. <laughs> okay, so just um, contact me and we'll have a, a conversation. Um, you know, we have we had to coordinate with, uh, you have to coordinate with Margaret on, um, on getting your families, but I will, I will walk you through our whole program. I'll be happy to help you. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome. Olga, what Penny tells me is, oh, Margaret, the children are ready for the, for the families. Which families do you need? Then I talk to my director and I talk to Huda in case management. And we look at a family that really needs help, like that big family you saw, family of eight <laughs> from Syria, or a family that is having a, li a little longer to, to be self-sufficient. Then that's the family we present. And amazing enough, well, the few times I've taken the families to Penny, I am shocked and surprised at how those children know the history of the countries where these people are coming from. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm always so surprised because the children end up going to do some homework or talk to their parents. And when we meet, they are ready with questions about Cuba and about uh, Syria. And I am always at awe at these kids. They're, they're very intelligent fourth graders. <laughs> I'm always so shocked. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. A little, a, a couple of other quick notes is that um, this is Refugee Resettlement Week, as I sent to you in an email. Um, I know that it's we're just just a little bit over, so continue to pray for the families who the families and individuals who are in other parts of the world who are suffering from persecution and fear. Um, and that's our gift of solidarity and our social principles. That's our core and, and in our corporate works of mercy. Um, the other thing is, is that on the advocacy side that we 
during the uh, past administration, we were called to, um, to do an executive order. So that meant to hand carry a letter to be signed by the county judge of each of the counties, 10 counties in the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, and all of the mayors. And so um, just, it was just uh, a great task, but we continue to carry that message on through our advocacy perspective as well. So uh, thank you so much for your time, your energy, your efforts. Yes, Margaret. Yeah, Rhonda, before we go also, mm -hmm. anybody who has asylum can come up to us uh, from Guatemala, El Salvador, um, so any South, um, uh, South American or any other person that received asylum, mm -hmm. you send them to us within the one, uh, six months, not more than six. <laughs> if it's more than six months, then they're gonna be, be in a Huda's program where there is no money. If, they, if there's within the six months down, then the federal government can still give them some money. Just, just Thank letting you. you know. Thank you so much. All right, well, we'll close with prayer. And okay. before we, we go to prayer, and Deacon Lolo is gonna close this out in prayer. Lord Jesus, give us more of your compassion for their plea. Soften our heart to their situation and help us to follow you, your lead and seeking justice and mercy on their behalf. We pray for an end to the war, poverty and human right abuse that derived despair people to become refugees in the first place. Amen. Oh, and then I the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank each of you. And thank you for being my partners in the vineyard. God bless you. Thank you, Rhonda, for this. Thank, thank you, everybody. You, thank you, Margaret, thank you. for the nice presentation. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Beautiful presentation. Thank you Great. so much. You did a wonderful job. Thank you all. Bye-bye.